Good evening, everyone. I want to introduce our keynote featured faculty speaker. It is an honor for the program to have David Carrasco speak uh, to you. He has the distinction of being the only faculty thus far to speak twice in the DivX program, so we're happy to have him back. I will read his bio to you um, as briefly as I can. He's done so much, it's hard to keep it too brief. Uh, David Carrasco, Neil L. Rudenstein Professor of the Study of Latin America with a joint appointment with the Department of Anthropology and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences is a Mexican-American historian of religions with particular interests in Mesoamerican cities as symbols and the Mexican-American borderlands. His studies with historians of religions at the University of Chicago inspired him to work on the question, quote, where is your sacred place, quote, unquote, on the challenges of post-colonial ethnography and theory and on the practices and symbolic nature of ritual violence in comparative perspective. Working with Mexican archaeologists he has carried out research in the excavations and archives associated with the sites of Tiknat Khan and Mexico, I'm totally mispronouncing it, so forgive me, uh, Mexico Tiknat Khan, resulting in religions of Mexico, America, City of Sacrifice, and Quetzalcoatl and the Irony of the Empire. An award-winning teacher, he has participated in spirited debates at Harvard with Professor Cornell West and Samuel Huntington on the topics of race, culture, and religion in the Americas. Please join me in welcoming Professor Carrasco. Let's see, can you hear me? Uh, if I, uh, this is a little low, but I think you can hear me. You know. Okay, well thank you very much Angela and uh, all of the people who made this uh, three days possible for you. I was over there with Cordado over here at the table and he was saying, uh, he's from Morehouse and he was saying he could tell how much care and planning went in uh, to this gathering, having you all here, creating this community. Uh, so let's give the staff a, a round of applause. <laughs> so it's also very good to be here with other faculty members. You can see a number of faculty members have come out tonight to meet you, give you support, uh, answer questions. Uh, uh, and so uh, that's a wonderful thing to see my colleagues. Uh, and it means that they're very interested in you. Um, some of them have driven a long distance to be here. They're interested in you and um, seeing you, listening to you, finding out uh, what kind of questions and interests you have. Uh, and it's also <clears throat> so fine to see here uh, our dean, uh, Dean David Hempton, uh, and his wife Luann, um, <clears throat> and, and the support that they give. I was just very fortunate to escort them and some other uh, members of the Harvard administration to Mexico. Uh, and as a matter of fact, at the end of my talk, uh, when we get into the q and I want someone just to ask me the simple question, why should I come to HDS? And I'll tell you a good story about Mexico <laughs> and, the, and the Hamptons. I'll tell you a story about the Hamptons. And it'll absolutely persuade you this is a good place for you. Okay? So <clears throat> the title of my presentation is Gifts from Mexico, Revitalizing Life Through the Day of the Dead Celebrations. How many of you have had a chance to go over to the Peabody Museum and just take a peek in uh, at the, the, uh, the ofrendas? That are, put your hands up higher. Let's, let's see some hands. Okay, there you go. That's wonderful. So some of you have already had a chance to see how Harvard University, uh, through the Peabody Museum Anthropology and the Harvard Divinity School, is celebrating the Dia de los Muertos as a way of trying to educate uh, the Boston and Harvard community about these gifts from Mexico. Now let me say a little bit about the first word in the title, gifts. <clears throat> because the fact of the matter is, we live in a society that, especially for the last couple of years, does not associate the word gifts with Mexico or Mexicans. Mexico and Mexicans are associated with walls. They're associated with criminality. 
They're associated with illegality. They're associated with just immigration. Uh, and nobody really thinks today, except a few of us, that Mexico also has gifts and brings gifts and has already contributed many gifts to the way in which the new demography in this country is leading to a better democracy, which is an uphill battle for sure. Uh, and what I wanted to do is to, to talk about this notion uh, of, of gifts from Mexico. Uh, and let me see if I can work this right. Um, and by beginning by, by showing you this very attractive, famous mural by the Mexican muralist Diego Rivera. Um, and this is a scene that he painted uh, that the whole mural itself gives a panoramic history of uh, of Mexico, from the pre-Columbian period through the colonial period, uh, through periods of slavery and anti-slavery, to independence, to the revolution, to today. And what you see here uh, is a sense of the Mexican diversity. There, uh, that circle is around the, the dictator, Porfirio Diaz. Uh, and in the middle, uh, we have the symbol of, uh, of death. Uh, this is a, a figure uh, that has become very popular in Mexico and among Mexican Americans. Uh, this is La Catrina. She represents death, but she represents a kind of sense of humor that Mexicans have about death. If you look at her closely, you'll see she's a fancy dresser. Uh, <laughs> she's got this great hat and this outfit, and Mexicans have created this figure because she represents those Mexicans who really wanted to become French. Okay? And uh, so they went into it because during the first couple uh, decades of the 20th century, there was a, a great romance between Mexico and, and Paris and France. Uh, if you go to Mexico City today, you'll see that the main, the main avenue uh, is the Paseo de la Reforma, and it's actually a copy of the Champs Elysees. Uh, and it's not a bad copy, let me say. Um, uh, and uh, the person up in the right, he, the, the first person I showed you, he's the one, he's the president that made this French thing uh, take place. So what Mexicans are saying here with La Catrina, uh, that's her name, is they're saying, look, it's okay if we Mexicans want to be somebody else. Uh, but you're going to be dead too, um, and you're going to end up this way. We're all uh, in this kind of a situation. So there's a sense of humor about it. Uh, Mexicans also uh, have a history of, of, of radical politics, uh, left-wing politics. And here is actually an image of a Cuban. This is Jose Marti, uh, the great uh, journalist uh, writer from Cuba uh, who came to Mexico and also influenced the way uh, many Mexicans thought about uh, their future. Uh, and this uh, image here, this is the very famous La Malinche. This is the woman, the indigenous woman who became Cortez's translator, but also uh, his mistress uh, bore him a son. And for many years in Mexico uh, was a symbol of a very negative view of females. But as a result of feminist uh, uh, writing and thinking, people have come to understand her as the great go-between. She was the bridge uh, that called my back. Um, uh, that joined Europe and indigenous people together to help create a, a significant part of who Mexicans were. Now, I, I show you this kind of diversity because I want to let you know that in my view, uh, the gift is what I call convivencia, what Mexicans call convivencia. But this is a very powerful word in Mexico and other parts of Latin America, and it's the gift. Um, the convivencia comes from two words, con, with, vivent, vivir, to live, to live with. Um, and it not only represents the sense of fiesta that's so important to Mexicans and Latinos, um, my definition of convivencia is really living together in order to give life the upper hand over death. Death is inevitable, but life is renewable. Um, and this is a very important type of, of gift that Mexicans bring. And I'm going to try to show you how the Dia de los Muertos is an example of a kind of a multiple kind of convivencia. Convivencia, in a sense, is what this whole gathering is about. Uh, the face-to-face, -face, uh, the getting to know each other's histories, uh, bringing your questions, uh, being able to spend time in a place that has great libraries, uh, which is certainly a convivencia. Uh, being here to honor us with your presence and help us understand your questions, that's a kind of convivencia, too. Um, uh, here's another uh, image, but I want to talk about three types of convivencia. First of all, I want to talk about convivencia as I experienced it in my family. I want to talk about a very unusual convivencia that I experienced between a great Mexican, <clears throat> a great Mexican muralist, Jose Clemente Orozco, 
and Toni Morrison. I had a chance to escort Toni Morrison twice to Mexico City in order to beat Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, Toni put herself in my hands and I spent time taking her to a number of places to show her uh, an alternative view of race and race mixture. Uh, as a result of that, Garcia Marquez and Toni Morrison became uh, good friends. Uh, we had a chance to spend time together and I was fortunate to bring, help bring Toni Morrison here to the Divinity School a few years ago where she gave uh, uh, the, um, uh, the Ingersoll lecture on, um, uh, on, uh, on immortality. Um, and uh, I want to talk about what I experienced in Mexico between Toni Morrison, an African American, and this great, uh, Mexican, uh, uh, this great Mexican muralist. And then I want to talk about what's here on campus, the Peabody Museum's Convivencia as gifts from Mexico. Here's another important image to look at. Here you see um, that man at the top, that's Benito Juarez. Benito Juarez was uh, president of Mexico. Uh, he was a full-blooded uh, Japotec Indian, uh, trained as a lawyer, um, considered the Abraham Lincoln of Mexico. But think of the difference between that and, and this country. That was in the 19th century, where you have a, a, an indigenous person. Uh, you know, what's the chance of having an indigenous person in this country uh, serving uh, high in the government, much less as a president, uh, which shows us that Mexican has, Mexico has some things to teach us uh, about uh, you know, the government and, and um, people living together. So the kind of main text of my talk is this powerful passage from Octavio Paz. Octavio Paz was uh, the Mexican uh, writer and poet who won the Nobel Prize in literature. And this is what he says about Mexico and convivencia. The history of Mexico is the history of a man seeking his parentage, his origins, or we could say her origins. He has been influenced at one time or another by France, Spain, the United States, and the militant indigenous of his own country. And he or she crosses history like a jade comet, now and then giving off flashes of lightning. What is she pursuing in her eccentric course? He wants to go back beyond the catastrophe he suffered. He wants to be a son again, to return <laughs> to the center of that life from which he was separated one day. Was that day the conquest, independence? Our solitude, our Mexican solitude, has the same roots as religious feelings. It is a form of orphanhood, an obscure awareness that we have been torn from the all in an ardent search a flight and a return, an effort to reestablish the bonds that unite us with the universe. That's part of the search of convivencia, to reestablish those bonds that not only relate us with nature, um, but also with society, with individuals, uh, with cuisines, uh, with the diversity of the world that we've always lived uh, within but tried to deny. So my family convivencia, just tell you a few things about me. Uh, my grandfather, Miguel Carrasco, built a school here at the American Smelting and Refining Company in the 1920s. And he built this school for Mexicans, uh, what we now would call the undocumented Mexicans, but at that time, nobody cared. This was a school for these Mexicans to learn the trades so they could uh, be able to not only earn money and uh, support their families, but in my grandfather's uh, philosophy about this school, which was called the Smelter Vocational School. It's there in the desert. You've got to understand these, many of these Mexicans are desert people. Uh, the idea of the school was not only are we learning in order to be able to learn a trade, but you're here also to become a better citizen. Not only a better citizen, but this is a way in which we can try to bring about social justice in our community. That was always the meaning of my grandfather's school. And so I grew up with that because my grandparents, in part, raised me Here's my grandparents, my grandmother Carlota and my grandfather Miguel. You'll notice that my grandmother has very dark skin. My grandmother uh, was part indigenous uh, from the Copper Canyon. Uh, she came out of the Copper Canyon during the Mexican Revolution, met my grandfather at the border, uh, and she was the favorite. She helped raise me and all of the grandchildren. We loved her, and we noticed that she had this beautiful skin. And we used to always uh, marvel at her skin. And we, we asked her one day, uh, Abuela, uh, what's the secret you know, of your skin? And she said, well, I have a secret ingredient. And we said, well, what's the secret ingredient? And she said, well, come over here and I'll whisper it to you. So we all leaned in uh, and she said, the secret ingredient of my skin is prayer, 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 and good cosmetics. 
And, uh, and, and in learning this from my abuela, my grandmother, who I was close to all her life, on the one hand, this idea of prayer, which was very important to her, this taught me as a child that, you know, there was important to be, uh, to, to think of your life in this world as related to things that also were not made by humans. Uh, that there was, uh, there was God, there were saints, uh, there were angels, there were spirits. There was all kinds of beings around who could be brought uh, into alliance. And that's a kind of convivencia uh, that she first taught me. But there was also the cosmetics. And I thought about that a long time. I had to think about that a long time. And I realized, or I took it to mean that uh, you know, this had to do with the technology, the technology of the face. Uh, how to bring your face into full view so you could be face to face with other people. And so I always thought of this kind of combination as something I was trying to do uh, you know, in my life. Uh, and I became a historian of religions and tried to do that. My father, and here you see him uh, all the way to the, to the left, my father was a, both a boxer and a basketball player from the Mexican border. Uh, uh, he grew up bilingually. Uh, part of his life was in Chihuahua. Uh, but my father uh, was uh, the first, check this out, my father was the first coach in the nation's capital to recruit African Americans to play in public sports in Washington, D.C. When I was growing up, I was 10 years old at that time, George Washington, Georgetown, University of Maryland only let white people play in public sports until this Mexican from the border came uh, and he felt very comfortable with black people and black people felt comfortable with him. Uh, because they knew when they saw him and we, they talked that there was a shared reality, a shared understanding of who the man was and how you had to deal with a man. Uh, and so he went and he took me as a 10 year old with him into the ghettos of Washington DC, uh, Upper Cardoza and other areas and he recruited the first African Americans and put together, this is a convivencia, this team of white and black players led by a brown man, brown by a coach from the, from the Mexican uh, borderlands. Uh, and this was important for me uh, to grow up uh, because by the time I was 15, I had a sense of the black community because uh, Willie Jones, the one is in the front row, he became an All-American. He set a, a record for the most points scored in a NCAA tournament game, 54 points. It still, uh, it still uh, holds that record today. Well, I used to travel with them. I used to get my hair cut down in the black barber shop. Uh, I was always with them. In fact, they'd always say, man, we can't get rid of you, man. Um, uh, and so this was a way in which I got a sense uh, of what convivencia was, but coming from a Mexican point of view, and my father passed away, they painted a mural of his life. Uh, he became the director of the Job Corps Center in El Paso. It's now the David Carrasco Job Corps Center. Uh, and you see him there, you see African Americans, you see Mexicans, you see him there with Edward James Olmos. And uh, I, I'm actually the feathered serpent over there on the right. Uh, that's me, uh, and so forth. And so this was the kind of convivencia that I grew up with that prepared me as a Mexican American uh, to, to enter into the life stream that I've entered into. And what I'm trying to do here is to show you a model uh, that's called existential anthropology, something that's very strong here in the Divinity School, uh, where your own life story matters uh, as long as you put it within a, a sense of critical, of critical analysis and thinking and expression. So the convivencia that I wanted to start with is that. The second convivencia has to do with Jose Clemente Orozco's mural uh, and Tony Morrison uh, who spoke, gave a lecture in front of this mural. Now take a look at this mural. The reason I'm showing you this mural because when we talk about the gifts of Dia de los Muertos, and those of you who've been over to the uh, mu museum, it's a feel good thing to go over there. You see a beauty of it. There's softness, there's sense of humor, there's a sense of solemnity, there's also a sense of celebration. And that's cool, I'm down with that. In fact, I helped the design part of the exhibition over there. But uh, Mexican Day of the Dead means something very important because of all the death that's been in Mexican history and the way in which uh, social stratifications uh, and violence and machismo and other things have caused all kinds of difficulties and pain for people. And uh, Jose Clemente Orozco, who painted this uh, at the University of Guadalajara, uh, he's trying to show that. He's trying to show that. And I want to come back to the mural in a second, uh, but I want to just give you a quick tour of, of what I'm trying to say. He wants to go back beyond the catastrophe he suffered, says Octavio Paz. So when the Europeans came with all their wonderful things that they brought, uh, there also was this incredible, this incredible population collapse. Take a look at that. In 1520, there were 22 million indigenous people. By 1580, uh, you know, there were 2 million of indigenous people. Now think about what that would do to your community. Let's say this community right here. If in the time between you now and you, you become a grandparent, 90% of the community is dead. What would that do to you? And the, what, what gods would you turn to? What kind of prayer would you have? Of course, death would mean something to you, and you'd have to come up with some strategy, some thinking, some ways of dealing with it, because it's all around. 
It's all around with diseases that your own religion and your medicine has nothing to do with. You don't know how to deal with it. So there's a sense, uh, I want to give you a sense of how powerful this, this stage of death was in Mexico. Uh, but what, what did Mexicans do? Mexicans began to mix together with, uh, I mean, indigenous people and Europeans mixed together in a, f a process called mestizaje which is the racial and cultural mixing of Europeans and indigenous people. And you have there on the right one of the great Costas paintings, which is actually showing that. Uh, and this is actually uh, a painting uh, that shows not only indigenous and Spaniards, but also Africans who came to Mexico rather large numbers. Uh, Africans are considered the third race in Mexico. Uh, you have the Europeans, the indigenous people, but Africans are very important uh, and even becoming more important in scholarship and studies uh, today. Uh, this actual image here, uh, let me take a quick look at it. This is a Spaniard and a mulata. So this is a Spaniard and a, and a, per, a woman who is already herself a mixed race between uh, a, a, another Spaniard and an African. And she's a mulata, and they're giving birth to a child who is even more complexly racially mixed, uh, a morisca. Uh, and so Mexico uh, has this kind of convivencia. It, it's like, our, it's like uh, Garcia Marquez says in the, um, uh, his tremendous speech uh, uh, in uh, the Nobel Prize, he says, with all this death, we chose life. We chose life. You know? And we, uh, regardless of, of, of how much social stratification there was, how much of a color line there was, as opposed to this country, no one ever thought of a color line being between black and white people. Spaniards tried to start that, but what happened was blacks and whites and browns and reds, they all started to mix and make new families. One of the gifts from Mexico is the sense of this multiracial family. Uh, I'm not saying Mexicans don't have their own prejudices, their own problems with this, but in Mexico there were all kinds of categories and locations and people dealt with it publicly. It wasn't just something that was in the indigenous community. Everybody knew about this race mixture and people talked about it. Um, but the fourth race in Mexico uh, is Asian people. Asian people started coming to Mexico in the 1550s as a result of the Manila Galleons. And here you have in 1700 uh, an Asian market in Mexico City. In the main market in Mexico City you have Asian, uh, Asian people, Asian culture, Asian language and so forth. So there's this convivencia here. As a matter of fact, when they started to excavate the great Aztec temple in 1979, one of the things they found right away was all kinds of stuff from China. And they were like, whoa, wait a second. Does this mean the Chinese were here before the Europeans? Well, no, but close. Uh, and uh, you, they found all of this stuff. So this convivencia that I'm talking about uh, is also evident in this, uh, this Japanese uh, screen fold, the biombos they're called, that come from Japan. But Mexicans took it, and they turned it into an art form that's theirs. This is an image painting of Mexico City on a Japanese art form. So you have this type of uh, very evident a long time uh, mixtures. Uh, but so after that period, you have the, uh, uh, you have the independence movement from, from Spain. And here you see uh, one of the great heroes of Mexico, Hidalgo. And you get a sense there of the violence, but also the cross, but also the sense of new life coming along. The Mexican Revolution comes along. And you have suffering and resilience and, and resistance. And here you see some of the women who participated in the revolution. Uh, these are the Adelitas, and uh, they're holding rifles. I can tell some of them don't know how to shoot rifles, but uh, they're there anyway. Uh, but the idea I'm trying to say is that uh, this is part of the violent history of Mexico, but there also was always this sense of trying to give life the upper hand. And I think that is what uh, I'm trying to lead you to show. Now, what happens is uh, Tony Morrison and I traveled to Guadalajara for the, Guadala for the uh, Guadalajara Book Fair. And she's invited to give a lecture at the, at the University of Guadalajara. Um, and uh, we arrive there, uh, and we go into the hall, and this is, the lecture, this is what you have to lecture in front of. Now imagine, imagine that you're asked to give a big public lecture. You walk in, and this is what's behind you. <laughs> I mean, you're going to be talking about whatever, but this is what's behind you. <laughs> And what you get a sense of is I sat in that audience with all the Mexicans there that night was that Jose Clemente Rosco, he threw down a challenge. He said, you're going to come up here and lay some stuff down. Here, deal with this. <laughs> Speak whatever you're speaking about. Can it resonate with this? And let me tell you, Tony Morrison, she did it. Now take a look at the, take a look at the image. So what you have in this image 
you know, is the Day of the Dead. On the right, you have these skeletal figures. These skeletal Mexicans were rising up in protest against the people on the left. Who's on the left? Well, scholars are on the left. Lawyers are on the left. Bosses are on the left. In the middle is this terrible fire. There's this terrible fire. And, and right over there on the right, you see a figure that looks like a Lazarus. Uh, you see him there? He's Lazarus, the Mexican Lazarus. Here he is. Uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's coming back to life, but through this kind of resistance and protest. And it's a ferocious protest because there's been all of this, this history that I'm telling you about. And over here, you see, you have one of these scholars. He's got weak eyes. He's going into the book over here, and he's got a knife here. So Orozco's trying to say uh, in this mural that's called The People and Their False Leaders. He's trying to say, you know, we have to own up to this history and we have to fight back. And that fighting back is a form of convivencia. Now, Toni Morrison comes. And Toni Morrison gets up and she gives a lecture. Can you hear me back there? She gives a lecture called The Foreigner's Home. And she starts talking to the Mexicans. And the Mexican place is standing room only. This is a huge lecture hall. It seats about 3,000 people. And I look around and I notice that at least half of the Mexicans have a darker skin than Toni Morrison. And everybody, almost everybody's got black hair. And Toni Morrison gives this talk. And the talk that she gives is incredible because what she does for the Mexicans is she joins them. And she says, let me tell you about immigration, what it really is about in relation to globalization. She says, globalization you know, has been risen to the level of a kind of a transcendent charm. And the reason it's such a transcendent charm is these people are so afraid that the colonized are coming back to the colonizer's home. Uh, and when they cross that border, they're coming back to the colonizer's home. And in fact, they're coming home. And certainly that's true for many Mexicans. They're coming home. It says, and, and these people, like you Mexicans, you're seen as people who are threatening, uh, people who are incomprehensible, people that we must continue to marginalize. And she starts to talk about all the gifts that people also bring, uh, and all the gifts that they understand. And when Toni Morrison finished with her convivencia, this Mexican muralist and this African-American joined that night, that was not only a standing ovation, the electricity in that room was so clear that the Mexicans really understood she was one of us. As a matter of fact, the first time we took, I took Toni Morrison to Mexico, I remember it was during the, um, it was during the uh, vacation period, and we went to the university. And we thought, well, nobody's going to be there. She gave this lecture. Man, it was, we couldn't get out of the car. To get out of the car, to get, into, to get into the auditorium. And as we walked along, I remember we walked along. They had all these signs up. These Mexicans had all these signs up. And they had a picture of Toni Morrison. And every sign said, Toni Morrison entre nosotros. Toni Morrison is among us. Toni Morrison is with us. Now, I wonder if my African-American brothers and sisters in this country would be so welcoming to a Latin American Nobel Prize winner. But the Mexicans were there to say, hey, man, she's one of us. We understand her because, in a way, she's writing about us. Now we come to the happy part. The Peabody Museum, the Convivencia, what's happened here, these gifts from Mexico. So, our solitude has the same roots as religious feeling, said Octavio Paz. It is a form of orphanhood, an obscure awareness that we have been torn from the all, and an ardent search, a flight and a return, an effort to reestablish the bonds that unite us with the universe. So on the right, what you have is a self-portrait by a Mexican-American uh, painter named George Yepes. And George Yepes uh, painted this. He grew up in a very tough Mexican barrio. He saw a lot of death, and so he did a self-portrait as a calavera as a skull, and he tried to, to show his sadness and his pain, uh, but to do it in such a way that it would communicate to people that would see it, hey man, we've got to deal with this. And over here we have a little happier notion. You have the little skulls. Notice that the skulls, these little sugar skulls are painted. They're painted with color, they're painted with flowers, and they're right there next to the bread. This is called the bread of the dead. These are two elements of always the Dia de los Muertos, and when you look here, See, this, this represents bones. When they make it, they got the bones. So you're eating the bones. Why do you eat the bones? Because in this worldview, the bones are seeds. The bones are the seeds. They go into the ground. 
and they stay there and they begin to germinate into some more spiritual identity. And in the Mexican world, they come back out again in some material form. It could be a butterfly, it could be food, it could be an animal, but there's always this notion of revitalization, this sense of uniting with the universe. Now, what happens in Mexico is uh, that the people put up these ofrendas or these altars, and this is one that's in a public square that university students have done. As a matter of fact, in many universities, the students, they do these kinds of things. And here you see what's called Mexico's totem, the skeleton. But check him out. He's laying up there. He's chilling out. He's up there uh, laying out. And what, what else is in this picture? Well, see the uh, flowers. So if the, this is a symbolic language. If the skeleton is the noun, the verb is the flowers, the flowering, because this is a flowering skull. That's the idea behind the Day of the Dead, that these flowers, these are called sempa sochilu, uh, these are 20 flower, uh, and they, uh, well, here's a wonderful painting by, uh, by Frida Kahlo. So Frida Kahlo painted this for inhabitants of Mexico, uh, and she's actually got in the background her blue house, uh, and as a child, there she is as a little child, she's saying these are four, four inhabitants of my Mexico. And so you have there a very pregnant looking uh, statue of an indigenous woman next to a skeleton, uh, next to a figure on the left. This is a Judas figure. This is a Judas figure and what they do, they, they light him up with firecrackers and stuff and they blow him up uh, during the day of the dead. But you have, you see, this whole idea of this religious feeling and also the skeleton. Uh, who's right there. And this comes in part from the in indigenous, the Aztec skeleton. The Aztec skeletons and these calaveras are very important uh, in the Aztec world because they were understood to be seeds. These were seeds. They were things that would germinate and be reborn. Uh, here you see an, a Mexican woman who, whose community has spent a lot of time going out in the month before the Dia de los Muertos and getting uh, these flowers. It's a flower that the Aztecs called 20 flower. 20 flower means the number, flower of completion. 20 is the number of completion. Um, and the idea was that the dead, uh, when, they, when they die, they become blind, but they can smell. And they smell their way back because of these flowers. These flowers uh, attract them back to the house. Uh, here you see a, a woman in one of the uh, cemeteries in Mexico. Uh, people uh, go and you see her there with the flowers. Uh, she's got her reboso on. Her people are preparing for the long night of the day of the dead. And, and what happens is people go. And they don't just make a half hour visit and put some flowers down and pray. They go there for hours. I've done this in Mexico. Uh, people go and they spend hours and hours. They take food, they take chairs, they take a little music, uh, they talk quietly, uh, they remember people, uh, they, uh, they, they feel sad, they feel together. Uh, and I see that in the, in the elder woman here, she looks uh, very sad, but the young person, uh, that's that life. You see, that's that life uh, always giving an upper hand. Um, and when I arrived at the Peabody Museum, they actually had this piece of sculpture that was without knowing what it was. This is the flowering skull. Uh, this is the idea that life and death are together, but life has some kind of, of upper hand. Um, another really interesting example of how people celebrate the Day of the Dead. Uh, here you see they've constructed something rather like a pyramid. You see the Sempao Xochitl flowers, but you also have the food. You always put the food out that people like. So my man here up the top, he liked that kind of tequila. There's some beer there. Uh, there's other kinds of soups. There's other kinds of bread. Uh, and the idea is that you, uh, you use a kind of food. Here you go. He's got my, he was a, th this guy was a Snickers guy. So they put a lot of Snickers. Now, I've been to some homes here in, in East Boston where people take these very seriously. If they have a, you know, if they have a, uh, half of their living room is set up with the Day of the Dead. And what they do is they cook food. They get together and they cook the best tamales, uh, you know, and the best atolis that they can. And, and they, they get together for hours and they put it on the ofrenda uh, with the pictures of those people who've, who've died in their family or friends. Uh, and the idea is that there is a spiritual union that takes place and these spirits enjoy the food um, uh, during this time. El pan de muerto se come con chocolate caliente. So you also have hot chocolate and this type of thing. But this other idea of the, what they do is they take these sugar skulls and they decorate them. Uh, and sometimes you'll actually decorate them for, with people who are alive. So if you have a, a, a novia, you put her name right there. She'll put your name right there and you put them around uh, because you know someday that's going to be you. But right now uh, you're celebrating uh, the, the colorful affirmative way. So I'm coming to the end here, but uh, you know, one of the things that I found when I came is they had this little dog, and this little dog is uh, holding the devil's face uh, in his mouth. Now this happens to be an Aztec pre-Columbian story. The story is that after the fourth, um, the, the fourth uh, cosmic era, everything was in darkness. 
the gods got together and said, man, we've got to spend somebody down into the underworld to get the bones uh, so we can make a new life out of those bones. And so they said, well, who's good with bones? Well, the dog is good with bones. So they sent the dog god, his name is Sholodl, and he dives into the underworld. He gets into the underworld, uh, and he meets the lord of the underworld, whose name is Miklant the Kutli. He's the, he's the bad cat. He's the, uh, he's, the, he's the lord of death. And he says to the dog, yeah, you can take the uh, bones, but first of all, you, gotta, you, gotta create a, you have to do a miracle. I said, what's the miracle? He says, you take this conch shell here, and you've got to make it sing by itself. So the dog, who is a divine dog, he calls the worms, and the worms, they bore holes in the shell. And then he calls the bees, and the bees come, and they hover inside. And pretty soon it starts to sing. And the Lord of the Wonder World realizes he's been tricked. Uh, so he allows the dog to get the bones. And the dog gets the bones. He digs them up. He's got them in his little bag. He's running. He's getting, uh, trotting out of the underworld. But the Lord of the Underworld has tricked him. And he's made this big hole. It covered up with grass. And as the dog's going by, this bird flies up. The dog gets scared, falls into the, uh, all the bones break. Uh, and the dog dies. But since the dog is a divine dog, he can regenerate himself. So he regenerates himself. He gets the bones. He goes to heaven, uh, goes back to heaven, and the, the goddess takes it, and uh, she grinds it up and puts it in her womb. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the, the male god comes. They have sexual intercourse is the idea. And out of it, they create new human beings. But every human being in the story is a different size. And they say, why are we different sizes? Well, that's been different sizes because when Sholodl uh, messed up and broke the bones, they all broke into different sizes. So that's why we're different sizes. And here he's got the devil. He's got the devil by the, because the devil is a part of Day of the Dead. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's got him and he's real happy. Um, the person who developed the art uh, of the Day of the Dead is up here on the left. His name was uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada. Uh, and he was the one, even before Day of the Dead became popular, who started to make political fun of people uh, by making everybody calaveras, skeletons. Uh, so there you see uh, a little skeleton guy, and he's um, proposing uh, to her. And she's going, oh, it's so nice, you know, and so forth. But they're both skeletons already. Uh, and you see on the, on, on the left, they're having a, f a fiesta, a party. But, you know, they're already skeletons. And on the right is the revolutionary. Uh, and the, the two figures that have become so powerful uh, all over uh, Latino communities here, and certainly in Mexico, are these two figures, La, El Catrin y La Catrina. And both of them are these Mexicans who are trying to be something else. They're trying to be, you know, French. They're trying to be so upper class. And you see her with her fancy French hat. There he's got his cigar. Check out his shoes uh, and so forth, his cool little hat. But they're Calaveras too. Uh, and so the idea is to, to make fun and to identify ourselves with this. Here's a statue of her. If you go to Mexico, you go to some of these, uh, you'll see this kind of art everywhere. That statue is about my size. Uh, I like this one. You see this little art here. There's a, there's a wedding, uh, and this, this couple is getting married. I'm coming toward the end, and uh, she, uh, uh, it's a Swiss chalet. I like it because the words say, make sure you have a Swiss watch so that you can be on time for your last appointment. So, <laughs> I have this kind of thing. Now, <clears throat> He, he wants to be a son again to return to the center of that life from which he was separated one day. So one of the things that we've done here in the Divinity School is to form a relationship with an artist named George Yepes. And George Yepes painted this uh, figure called the Caballero Aguila. And this was to inaugurate a new lectureship in Mexico that the Divinity School, under the leadership of David Hempton, uh, is part of the inauguration. The first time in the f almost 400 years of Harvard that there's a lecture series named after a Mexican. Check it out. What's wrong with this place? It's finally catching up. Uh, you know, I was the first Spanish surname uh, professor in the history of the Divinity School, 150 years, uh, uh, two, 200 years. What's going on here? Well, you know, now we have others here uh, who are also Spanish surname, uh, and they're doing great work. So uh, here you have George Yepes painting uh, the sun in the form of an eagle warrior who's rising above Mexico City, uh, and that the figure over there on the right, that's Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, who the lectureship is named after. Uh, so here you have another type of convivencia that's going on between the Harvard Divinity School and Mexico in a very interesting way. So what happens, and this is the final thing, uh, on the Days of the Dead here at Harvard, uh, people come to the museum, uh, and uh, many of the students dress up like, uh, like La Catrina or like Calaveras. And here you see some of our students who have already graduated. They look beautiful, and they have done these uh, wonderful paintings. Uh, they bring flowers, but they also bring... Uh, this type of face painting. And what happened was, to show you what one of Mexico's gifts to this university, 
it's just for casualidad. Just somebody just decided, let, let's leave a little basket out here and let's put some pieces of paper and a pencil and just leave a sign if you want to write a note to somebody who's dead in your family or whatever, please do so. So they thought they, they got thousands of these things, thousands. And they brought them to me and I started looking at them and they're all these languages. I mean, they're in all these incredible languages. Let me just show you. This year, on the first day, uh, I this is what the, what the person, who, I collected the first two rows of message of love cards to make room for the weekend event. Um, they were messages in French, English, Polish, Spanish, German, uh, uh, Korean, and little kid scrawls. <laughs> Parents, grandparents, dogs, friends, artists, musicians, and writers, people who are suffering loss and victims of natural disaster were noted and remembered. And here's some of the things that are said. Now, the reason I mention those languages because here's my point. You see, people come into the museum Maybe they're atheists, maybe they're Catholics, maybe they're Muslims, maybe they're Buddhists, but they're not going to come there and admit, well, I'm going to communicate with somebody who's dead. But they do. And what you find is that for this one or two days where this takes place, all of the ancestors of all these different ethnic groups and religions, they're just present for a little bit together. You see, and that's the convivencia that I'm talking about, that the Mexican mixtures can really contribute Check out some of these messages. Amor y God bless y gracias to Benny King, John Coltrane, Lady Day, Octavio Paz, James Baldwin, and Frida Kahlo. <laughs> I hope the ones who've lost people dear to them are able to have strength and hope by coming together with those who remain. Another one. You died seven years before I was born, Mom, says it was from alcohol and cigarettes. I do not blame you for going. Thank you for my mom. <laughs> I'm proud of the daughter you left for me. She says she has your temper, but also your determination. I hope I do too. I'm writing from Harvard, where I am a freshman. That is incredible to me, and I know traceable to you. I hope my success is in no small way yours too. I miss you, another one. I miss you, but above all, I love you with every fiber of my being. <laughs> To my mother and all the mothers, thank you for everything for existing. Grandpa, I'm sorry that my Spanish was never good enough to have a deep conversation with you. I wish I could have known you better. Your actions and love showed that you were a great man. You taught my father so much, thank you. Another one. I hope your journey is smooth and the afterlife full of the love and tenderness that you didn't get in this life. Another one, you would love this event. <laughs> I don't honor you enough, but blood, blood ties aren't the only important ones. Check out this one, Boo Dog, you were my first dog and I will never forget you. I hope you're having fun terrorizing all the cats up there. <laughs> Tupac and Biggie Smalls, rest, rest in peace. Papá, pensamos mucho en usted, su, hi, su hijo que lo ama mucho. Then, dear Johnny Cash, thanks for speaking out against injustice and helping my grandfather and I bond. And then I just bought a few of here, just a few more, and then I'll end it. I just bought some of them for you. Dear Johnny, I really miss you. I hope we could play guitar together and go snowboarding. Please, if you get another life, Never drink and drive. Isn't that deep? Dear Zeus, you are a very loud bird, <laughs> but you could sing beautiful songs. I wish you were still alive. I feel very sorry for you, dear Sam and Sarah. Sunflower, I love you, baby girl. You were the best rabbit. I mean, it goes on and on. It's amazing what this gift is that I'm talking to you about. You know? And so what we did is we set up this, uh, this altar. I came here 15 years ago. They didn't have this. I helped them curate this. And this has been the most living thing in the third floor of the museum all this time. And here's my final point about this. What happened here is an example of what I'm talking about, about convivencia. This is what it looked like at the beginning. If you go over there today, 
what you will see is that over the years, without anybody asking permission, members of the staff have gone up there and put photographs of people that they love to have passed away. There's professors, there's cats, there's dogs, there's friends, and this thing has become now, you see, it's alive. Because these spirits are these people, they're there. And the other day I gave a lecture over there, and one of the people in the staff came up and said, you know, I lost both my parents this year. And listening to you give me permission, I, I don't know if I'm going to go put that photo or something. But this is the convivencia I want you to think about. This is the gift from Mexico. And uh, I hope that it, uh, it stimulates you to not only think about your own lineage and the gifts that your traditions bring, but it comes uh, to let you think and understand that this divinity school is also a gift and it's waiting for you. Thank you very much. So we have, I know I went a long time, but I think it was worth it. We have a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, uh, this is the last painting that Frida Kahlo did called Viva la Vida. So who's got a question? Yeah, um, my name is Ana del Castillo, and I go to Tufts University, but I'm from Mississippi. Um, and I have a very important question for you, and it's why Harvard Divinity School? <laughs> Let me tell you why. So this is my story about why you should come. There's many reasons, but one of them is the dean. Okay. Now the dean, you see, I'm here with the dean uh, and Luann in Mexico City. All right? And, and what, what it is about the dean in the school is it's going to bring the best out of you. Now take a look at this picture. See, this is how the dean brought the best out of me. So we're at the Vir Virgin of Guadalupe's place. And there's the dean and, and Luann, and I'm trying to talk to him, see? And I'm trying to persuade him. And you see, I, I'm making a gesture, and look at him, he's not convinced at all. He, he's not convinced at all, see? So, so I decided that, you know, the dean has hardly ever heard me speak. You know? But I've heard him speak. The reason that I hear him speak is I love to hear him speak. He's measured, he's soft, he's got that little Irish thing, you know? Uh, and it's good. Well, he's heard me speak, but I'm just saying, I'm trying to hear, so check it out. So I, I, he challenged me to really go, see? So I had to go dramatic, and you see, he's pulling out the best of me. This is what the school's gonna do for you. You see me there? And, but he's still looking like, I don't get it, man. What, what is it? I don't get it. I don't get it, you know? It's still like, look at him. He's like, nah, I don't get it, man. So now I'm really going, see? Uh, so I'm really throwing my emphasis. I'm really throwing my emphasis. And you get a little glimmer in his eye, but not much. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best. He's bringing the best out of me, this dean. See, he's bringing the best out of me. Uh, and and uh, now he's joining me in the focus. I have made some progress. This is what'll happen to you if you come here working with these professors, with Myra, uh, with uh, Kimberly. Uh, they're gonna bring this, like, so look at it. I know I almost got him. I almost got him. And, and so, look, he, I got him to pivot. He, he's, he's now pivoted in the direction that I want him to pivot in, you see, and, and he, he's saying, well, maybe Carrasco has something to say. Uh, there it is. And, and what it is, I'm pointing to him, is the, just at that moment, uh, a peregrine nation was coming. Here comes a pilgrimage, and this is a pilgrimage uh, of uh, actually mestizos. This is mixed race people who have identified themselves in terms of indigenous dress. Uh, they're coming, they've come from Guadalajara. They've taken a lot of walk. I was, I was telling the dean about it. Uh, and they, they pose for us. Uh, and here they are. Uh, and what they've got uh, to show you this idea of convivencia uh, is they've got right here, you know, their saint, St. John the Baptist. So here's the mestizos dressed up as Aztecs bringing St. John the Baptist to the Virgin of Guadalupe. And over here you see a woman who's actually crawling on her knees. Uh, it's showing that kind of river of devotion. So but my feeling about it is that if you come, I now stand tall with Dean Hempton. Yeah, I've, I've, won him. I, I've persuaded him, and you can see that I was, and this will be, your success will be just as successful as I was. So let, let's have another round of applause for Dean Hempton. Many other people in the faculty, and I think that uh, the 
another reason to come to this place is that you can help it grow. You can help it become what it needs to become through you know, your life, your intelligence, your interaction. Uh, and, and this place, uh, you know, I've been here since 2001, and I can tell you this is a great school to be in because it's got human resources, it's got this incredible staff, and it's curious about where we should go in the future. And that curiosity is a way of asking you your questions of what you want to do. Okay? Who else? Go back here and question now. And, and maybe, maybe other people here can ask, answer the, respond to the question as well. Hi, my name is Rita Rodriguez. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. And I was just wondering, um, I've only recently come to understand my identity as a first generation and Chicana. Um, and I wonder how HDS can help me understand and each of us understand our identities and how we fit and how um, each of us are unique to this program. Well, in, in a way, you know, your, your question uh, is sort of developing into a very nice answer response. Uh, because, you know, the, the, here at, at this school, in particular, this school is part of a wider university. The school, the students that come here, not only get in, involved in the resources in terms of identity formation and history uh, and the, the being of geography and society and so forth, but you've got the whole university. And you can, and many of the students draw from other parts of the university. I mean, we have, in terms of the, the whole question of the, the contribution in the lives of Latinos, we have uh, Professor Maya Rivera is here. Uh, and she's brought a whole new rich sense of not only theology, but sort of the history of language itself, interpretive languages. Uh, and she's here to, to respond to you. And, uh, she's also now one of the leaders of the ethnic studies movement on this campus. So if you come, you bring your gifts, your questions, your new identity to us. And we also, our identity is also changing. Uh, you know, as I said, I came, and then Maya Rivera came. And we'll be joined by others, uh, and we want to be joined by you. Now, I know San Antonio a little bit because I was very close to Father Luis uh, and, and also John Philip Santos, who wrote this wonderful book about San Antonio called Places Left Unfinished at the Time of Creation. Well, that's the hard of living in school, too. It's unfinished. And as uh, you know, Carlos Fuentes said, we're unfinished projects. Uh, and in that, there's great hope. But there you know, has to be this kind of dialogue. Where, where you make new discoveries, study how other new discoveries have led to uh, new types of relationships and convivency. And uh, I think that uh, this is a good place to be. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Quinn, um, and I'm from Southern California. And um, something about uh, your presentation I just found extremely moving. I'm um, explaining what convivencia is and the significance of Dia de los Muertos. And I think that um, something about California, I guess I should say first, is that people are friendly, at least where I'm from, and, uh, and are very outgoing. And I think if someone were to um, ask me what Dia de los Muertos is in passing or in short conversation, how would you answer that? What is Dia de los Muertos? Yeah, shortly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dia de los Muertos is a celebration of family. Not only your biological family, but also you know your extended family that comes out of this whole Mexican sense of family. And what the Mexicans have done in the Day of the Dead is they created a, a, a day for the ancestors, a time, a day of time, a time when we not only remember them, but they, we we understand them to be present. Uh, so I would say something like that. You know, what I think is the greatest book written recently on Mexican religion is by William Taylor. It's called. Uh, Theater of a Thousand Wonders. And one of the points he makes is that, look, if you scratch a Mexican uh, or, or a Puerto Rican uh, or other Latinos, you really scratch them, you're going to find that there's a sense that uh, that prayer, 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 you know, that presence, there's a sense of presence. And it may not just be the God, but there's a sense of other presences. And the Day of the Dead is, is about being aware of these other presences. To give life the upper hand over death. Cool. Uh, 
Um, this is less of a question and more of a statement. Um, I just really wanted to thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm from Las Cruces, New Mexico, which is a like a region that's like I don't want to say really well known for, but like to us, like Dia de los Muertos is a really huge deal. Yeah, it is. It's a huge deal to us. And as a um, as a New Mexican implant into Arizona, I was recently just complaining to some uh, other Latino colleagues about how. Like our campus doesn't really get into Dia de los Muertos, and I th just thought your illustration of Coviventia. Oh man, Coviventia. Coviventia. I I don't speak Spanish well, um, <laughs> but just um, seeing so many cultures just engage in Dia de los Muertos, I think that that is such a powerful, like a really powerful illustration of that. And so I just think that's really beautiful. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I think that really speaks to the culture of what Harvard Divinity School is and how much it really treasures its diversity and um, opportunities of cultural exchange. It does, and, and the professor sitting right next to you, Emily Click, she's been involved in uh, uh, you know, the projects that go down to the Mexican border uh, and, and deal with the border. And the thing is, uh, you know, listen, many, many people who have a, a Spanish background don't speak Spanish as well, but we're learning better. Uh, and that's all you can do. And here at this school, there's also classes in Spanish. And this campus is very rich. My wife uh, uh, teaches Spanish. Uh, she's in charge of, of the Spanish program in the, uh, in the religion of romance languages. So you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the right here. Yeah. Thank you very much for your lecture. I want to say, my name is Gertz. I'm just going to sit down. Okay. Um, <laughs> my name is Gertz, and um, I wanted to ask, I know you talked about the unfinished projects here at Harvard and the, increase, and the increasing and within di um, ethnic diversity with the faculty and staff and students, how do you see the unfinished project of undocumented persons and DACA persons like myself with admission here into Harvard and finding a place here? So, so, so just say the last part. Uh, oh, I saw her. I talk really fast. Um, <laughs> um, you s talked a lot about ethnic diversity and how that is an unfinished project here at Harvard. How do you see um, the change within the finished project of undocumented persons and DACA persons like me yeah. here at um, Harvard University? Well, I think that uh, you come, you know, you come at a good time, which is a bad time <laughs> for DACA and undocumented people. But this school, in particular, and other parts, there's a strong movement at Harvard, a very strong movement at Harvard, to to see how we can not only receive undocumented students, but to support them here, to protect them when we need to protect them, and to find ways, you know, because as you know. You know, undocumented work, there's so many variations on the situation of undocumented people. They're not, all the, they're not all in the same situation. We have some other people here uh, who are presently, uh, you know, have been in the school who are, who are DACA. So uh, we are educating ourselves. Uh, the faculty had to educate itself, not only in this school, but in other parts of Harvard. And there's a strong movement. And it's not only a movement led, led by faculty, the students have been leading this movement. Um, and uh, again, you know, someone like uh, Professor Maya Rivera Rivera could speak to this as well. Uh, she's right over there at that table. Uh, and, uh, you know, she and I will stand arm in arm with you uh, and even get arrested if you have to. <laughs> but it's really more about what this school can provide is, is a sense of giving you and all the students who are interested a kind of historical, cultural, and religious understanding of what sanctuary means and what it's meant. Uh, you know, in a broad sense and in a specific sense. So I think that, um, you know, if I didn't feel this, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage DACA students to come unless I felt there's, that we got some fight back here. We do. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alexis, and um, as a person of color and as a black woman in America, I see how deeply ingrained racism is in American history. So I wanted to ask, uh, do you think that the damage and racism um, that in part has been here for a very long time, but also has kind of heightened and risen during this administration can um, somehow be rectified, not only for um, black people, but also for any person of color in this kind of um, state? And also, do you think that this change in mentality will happen during your lifetime? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or in mine, too. 
put on some salsa music so we can learn <laughs> yeah. uh, Well, I think that's a great question, but I wouldn't want to begin to answer it, but to say, no, no, we have to fight to rectify it. You know, I, I'm, I tend to be an optimist at the end of the day, but it's really harder and harder because it seems to me the present administration uh, and its international kind of, of plan, as well as its national plan, is extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous. And it seems to me that one of the reasons I give this talk is because I want to see black, brown, black, brown, you know, people really fighting together, educating each other, and, and, and anybody else who wants to be part of that. And I think the Mexican example, with all of the pain that Mestizo suffered and indigenous people suffered, there's still an opportunity there to push this convivencia plan so that we can take the long fight. You know, I mean, of course I'm, I have some hope, you know. I, just to share this with you, you know, I'm doing a, a book with Toni Morrison. I, I spent uh, two afternoons with her this summer at her house. And she's writing a new novel. And, um, you know, in that language, in that storytelling, in that spirit of hers, I mean, absolutely there's a chance to rectify. But we're all scared. And I think we have to pull together and not let the fear paralyze us. I think that's really important that I so much appreciate your question, except for maybe the last line. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. If I get another question on these Latinos, I'm going to ask Myra to speak up over there because she's involved in this struggle here, as well as others. Since my colleague puts me on the spot, <laughs> I mean, I I just want to say echo. Thank you so much for this presentation and. And in response to to all of your questions, would say that um, at the Divinity School and in, at the university, um, we are very aware of these questions, right? And in working hard to address them, not only at the level of the services. Um, for, for the students, but, but also at the level of what we teach and how we teach, um, and working in collaboration with many, many different parts of the university, and in collaboration with our students. So I really, really would love to be in a place such as this, uh, how we are here tonight. Um, and I encourage you to ask as many questions of us as you want in the coming weeks. Um, and because we really, really want to explore with you the possibilities of you becoming part of this rich community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi again. <laughs> um, so, as a young Native American and someone who experiences the struggle of having uh, my identity and community in general recognized in this country, similar to Mexican Americans, I um, would like to ask how I and my Native community at home can support, um, as an ally, the Mexican American community who is dealing with a lot of the same struggles that we are. Well, you know, during the uh, struggle here this last year about the you know, undocumented, um, we had a number of meetings with other faculty uh, to try to figure out the way ahead. And you know, something came to me that that, uh, that took to take place in the '60s and '70s, and that was what they call teachings. Uh, you know, protest is good, but I think we need these teachings where people would come together, you know, with representative in this case from Native American community. Mexican, whoever wants to come. And there's somebody there to give a good history, to give people up on what's the present political situation. And then after that, we talk about how much we want our identities to be around this. You see. And so for Mexican Americans, Mexican Americans and Mexicans, you know, they have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn about Native American experience and positions in this country. Um, we still have a lot to learn about 
uh, what African Americans have done in this country to open the way for everybody. Uh, if it was up to me, you couldn't become a citizen in this country unless you spent 15 hours with eyes on the prize. Or you might have to take it. Then you could qualify for citizenship. Because the black struggle for freedom in this country, in my view, really set the model and opened the way for a lot of the stuff that goes on. It's not the only group. So we have to learn that struggle. We have to learn there's got to be a lot of education. And out of that education comes the stages of activism. That's the way I, I see it. I mean, I was involved in, I was, I was a member of the Young Lords. As a matter of fact, I was a minister of education for the Young Lords for a while. And that was a very tough group. We had Black Panthers and Young Lords. And what I remember about that is how much, how loud we were without knowing what we were saying. <laughs> we were really loud. Yeah. You know? And it got the attention of Mayor Daly and all the police. But when it came down to it, well, you know, our, our program was not really well thought out. But you need that combination. What the Pablo Neruda calls the, the, the two stars uh, of the struggle. One is struggle, lucha, and one is esperanza. And part of that lucha is education. You know? And I think that uh, that's what we need to do. So it's been a long evening. You've been such a great group. And the dean is here. I'm still trying to press him and get to the <laughs> So thank you much, everybody.